Hello and welcome back uh, here at Kessel House. Our next uh, speaker is Grant Ingersoll, co-founder and CTO of Lucidworks. And his work's title is BM2825 is so yesterday. Uh, better ways to do search. Uh, you have your own microphone. You. Stage is yours. All right, first talk after lunch. Is everybody awake? All right. How many of you are actually search developers and you spend a lot of time on relevance? All right, so let's get started and let me see if this fits with what your life looks like. User comes in on your site, type in iPad case, and they do a search. And you being the good engineer that you are, whether you're using Solar or Elastic or any other search engine out there, you probably do some things, query parsing, et cetera, and you might generate a query that looks something like that. Lots of variations on this thing. I could make it harder, I could make it easier, all of those kinds of things. But essentially underneath the hood, you're doing something like that. And then your engine goes off, and if you were in earlier talks, you can kind of learn about what's happening underneath the hood in Lucene. Your engine goes off and it comes back with these two results. Now, I'm actually not a German uh, football fan, but I looked up a few. The very first one, Darmstadt, I looked up the stats for this year's uh, season. They're in last place, whereas Munich is in first place. But you can see in the search engine, Darmstadt come up, comes up as number one, and Munich comes up as number 15. And of course, we've got some fans of Darmstadt over here, but the reality is, your marketing team, your boss, your customers, they really don't like Darmstadt, right? They want Munich to be at the top. In fact, when your marketing team comes and talks to you, they say Munich outsells Darmstadt like 100 to 1. Could you please make Munich be at the top of the list just like they're at the top of the standings? No offense. And so, as a good engineer, you start to dig in. What would you do? You start to dig in. Where do you start? Well, you go read the manual. Lucene, Solar, all these engines, they have pretty good manuals out there. The beauty of open source is you could actually even look in the open source. Maybe you start to dig in and you realize, oh, well, what I'm going to do is when that document comes in for Munich, I'm going to hard code 100 as a boost on that document. And that's going to make Munich come up at the top. Or maybe at query time, I'm going to be even smarter, and I'm going to take my main query, and I'm going to or it together with something else. And now, all of a sudden, whenever somebody searches for uh, football, or sorry, uh, yeah, football, I keep wanting to say soccer, no offense. Um, when somebody searches for a particular team, et cetera, we can make sure that Munich comes up at the top. Maybe that doesn't work, right? People have tried that, sometimes it works, most of the time it works, sometimes it doesn't. So then, oh, I heard about this thing in Lucene called explains, or debug query if you're a solar user or whatever other engine you're using, has similar functionality, and you get something that looks like that. It's an eye chart, don't worry, I don't expect you to read it, but it tells you all of the gory details about why that document scored the way it does. And in fact, I've used this a lot of times in my careers to figure out what the heck is going wrong with search. Still, maybe you don't figure it out, and you go get Doug's book, or you go get my book, or you go get Trey and Tim's book, and you say, I'm going to really learn this stuff. I'm going to dig in. I'm going to figure out all the theoretical stuff. I'm going to learn what TF-IDF and document length normalization and all of these kinds of things are. Maybe I'm going to figure out what the heck that thing is. That's BM25, hence the talk title. And this stuff is all really good. You should definitely learn this as a search engineer. I'm not here to try to dissuade you out of that, but what I really want to talk about with this talk is how do we put this kind of stuff in the perspective of what you're seeing out of more modern search approaches. So first off, after you've done all that low-level stuff, you might have this brilliant idea that says, well, how do I really know whether this stuff is working? And so you read these books and you start to say, oh, well, we need to measure things, 
right? So maybe the first thing you do is you just start asking your colleagues, hey, what do you think of this result for this query? This is our most popular query. What do you think of these results? And you could go and do that with additional users. You can maybe set up some focus groups with your customers. If you've ever heard of something like Trek, you can actually go download like a whole data set from the academics that will help you judge how your search results are doing. Maybe, just maybe, if you have enough people on your team, you might have a company gold standard for your content. So you can actually measure your own relevance. You tend to only see that at companies that are really big and have like 100 or 200 person teams who do nothing but work on relevance. And in fact, those companies usually are monetizing their search results, which is why they spend so much time on this. And you might dig in, and if you were at the earlier Learning to Rank talk, you can see details around some of these metrics you might care about, precision, recall, NDCG, MRR, all of those fun terms. And then, just like how your shampoo recommends that you lather, rinse, repeat, you're going to keep doing this. And this is basically job security for you because you're the relevance person at your company, and you're really smart, and so you're going to keep doing this and doing this and doing this and doing this. And in fact, I've been doing this for too long to remember. The reality is it's a lot of work, right? It's a lot of hard work. And maybe there's some better ways. And so as a developer, you have a brilliant idea, and you ask yourself, what would Google do? And what Google would do is say, let's make you do all the work. And then I'm just going to harvest the information from all of the users that are interacting with it. I'm going to build out these fancy machine learning and AI and all of those kinds of stuff. And so that's kind of where we end up. And so now to kind of put this stuff in perspective in terms of thinking about the bigger picture around relevance is if you take a, kind of a stack here, this core information theory here, that's Lucene, Solar, Elasticsearch, you name it. That's kind of that core cosine similarity, TF-IDF, BM25 thing. The reality is, is that's good for getting you somewhere between 50 and 70% of the way when it comes to relevance. Depending on who you talk to, I once sat next to the CTO of Yandex at a, at a workshop, and he told me, in his opinion, at the time, Core BM25 only got you about 50% of the way in terms of relevance at the uh, stage like a large-scale web search engine. And then, you know, over the years, all of these engines have built tools to help you better navigate this content, so things like facets, did you mean, all of that kind of stuff, highlighting. And then, obviously, you have some business-specific things that you're doing. So, you know, you start adding in rules. You start hard-coding things like Munich gets 100 and Darmstadt gets negative 50, all of those kinds of things. But the reality is, these days, to kind of get to that next level, most people are starting to adopt this approach of learning from your users and learning from the content at a much deeper level, applying machine learning across the stage here, doing things like personalization, crowdsourcing, user feedback, et cetera, to help you better understand what's going on with the content. And then in my best New York accent, that last bit of getting perfect results, well, forget about it, as they say in New York, uh, because you're never going to get there. So when your boss is yelling at you about why not everything is perfect, you can just tell him, well, I've done everything else Grant said in the stack, but there's always going to be some queries we just can't make be the best they can be. So what does this stuff start to look like? When I think about the bigger problem, I tend to think about relevance going across three different dimensions. The first one is the content side of the things. This is the stuff you're all used to as search developers working on, right? And it's still really important. It's still good for you to make sure you understand what fields you're searching on, make sure you understand how Lucene and Solar are doing their things, make sure you've got your faceting and business rules and all of that kind of stuff. But these days, I spend most of my time, that's kind of a given, if you will, with Solar, spend most of these times on things like collaboration and context and how do we leverage what information we know about what other users like you have done, as well as who you are, where you are, what's the context of your situation in this particular uh, case. So what does this look like as we dig into the real world? 
Well, so first off on the indexing side, you often see more and more things like machine learning taking a look at building up a conceptual model of all of your data. So for instance, if you've heard the word word to vac or if you do named entity recognition, if you're doing topic detection, all of those kinds of things, start to factor in. You've built these offline models that you're injecting in at indexing time, such as contents coming through. You're tagging that up. You're enriching it, all of those kinds of things. You've been doing that for a number of years. The cool thing these days is there's a lot of new technology out there uh, that makes this stuff even better. You might have your domain rules still, and then you output all of that content to solar. What you're starting to see now more and more is take a tool like Spark, bring in the data, and it's kind of this continuous model now where you're constantly improving these models. I kind of think about it as your search engine is your real-time best known state of your data, and then offline, you're constantly trying to improve that state of the data, right? Such that then, for us anyways, we put all of those models back into solar, and you'll see some of this here as I demo later, and then just continue on. Lather, rinse, repeat takes on a new meaning here because instead of you spending your time hard coding your rules, you're spending your time figuring out how to make better models that scale better, that are more representative, more generalizable, all of that kind of stuff. What's the query side look like? Well, we got our happy user over here, or hopefully happy user. One of the first things you start to see coming into play above and beyond what people typically do when they have solar is one of the first questions you want to ask yourself is, what does this user actually mean by this query? And do you even need to search, right? We assume as search developers that because people put in a query to your search engine that you damn well better hit the search engine because that's why I'm doing this all for. But the reality is, is you don't necessarily need to do that. If a user comes onto your uh, site and says, how do I open a new account? They don't want to see 10 blue links. They want, to take you, they want you to take them right to the account opening page. Or if they say, how do I make a return? Again, don't show them 10 blue links that have the word return in them. Take them to the page that says, here's how you make a return, right? So you don't always have to be in this mindset of search. So you want to think then about a couple of different things with query intent. I tend to break it down into a couple pieces. The, tr the strategic side of it is, what is the overall intent? Is this user looking for a product? Are they looking for help? Are they you know, teenagers being stupid and giving you spam, et cetera, et cetera? The tactical part of that then is, what are the key parts of that query that I can then leverage to make for a smarter query? Somebody comes in and searches for iPad, well, that's a brand, it's also a tablet, it's, it's a product. They might say 32 gigabyte uh, iPad with a brown leather case, in which case you have a brand and then you have a bunch of attributes. Or they might spell things wrong, et cetera. So you have all these tactical bits that you want to identify as part of that intent, and then you can feed that into semantic engines. Next thing I often do is think about how does this query relate to all the other queries that I've seen before? Especially if you're in a consumer-facing search site, you often have a, a power law distribution for your queries. You know, 80% of your queries uh, represent, or 20% of your queries represent 80% of the volume that kind of stuff. And so you might start to look at how am I going to leverage what I know about what are called my head queries, my most popular queries, to help answer what, do I, uh, what I know about my tail queries, my less frequent queries, right? And there's often actually a lot of really interesting relationships there. In fact, I was just working with a pretty large, this is a top 10 uh, e-commerce site uh, the other day. Something like 50% of their tail queries are one of two things. They're either spelling, misspelling, or their attributes on a head query. 50% of their tail. So that's that really long, long tail. And the reality is, is most people are really good at tuning their head queries, especially at really large scale. So if you can help them improve 50% of their tail, they're going to thank you quite a bit because they're laughing all the way to the bank, as they say. The other interesting thing about this is all of this data, this clickstream data, this is the same data that makes for better search. 
It's the same data that makes for recommendations. It's the same data that makes for personalization. And it's the same data that makes for analytics. And yet all too often I see companies who have those things all spread out in a lot of different places. So for instance, they put up the site, users start clicking, that goes off into Omniture. Omniture over to the data science team. Data science team goes and builds some fancy model. The engineers get that fancy model and they say, wow, that's great. We get a lot of uplift off of this model but gee, that's too bad, it's gonna take us four months to actually get it into production because it's built in R and it's slow as can be, right? So we wanna solve those kinds of problems. Other things you might start to factor in is what user factors you have in the query. Are these young, old, male, female, green, brown, blue, whatever it is that you use as factors for understanding your users? then you want to start to bring those in. Things like their history, their profile. Does this user prefer luxury brands or do they pr uh, prefer value brands? How do you use those things to bring into your search world? As well as things like security, if this is behind the firewall, who can access what data, all of that kind of stuff. On and on we could go from there. We could apply our domain specific rules. We hit solar. I'll show you what kind of this query looks like here in a minute. And then this is where it gets really interesting. These days, I think a lot of people who have been in the Lucene and Solar land, they tend to think about, oh, well, I hit solar, I do one query, and then I get back my results. Maybe you've heard about the re-ranker or the re-scorer as it's called in Lucene. And so maybe you might think about how do I do some of that kind of stuff. The reality is if you look at the top tier of search engines these days, they actually are doing a whole cascading set of re-rankers such that something like a Lucene-based engine is, you can kind of think about it, that's my coarse-grained search results. It's the one that more or less matches. And then you apply a series of re-rankers on top of that. I know some companies who have a single model just for scoring number one versus number two in the search results. Think about that, right? A lot of companies too, like if you heard the Bloomberg talk earlier, they talk about how you, know, you might have solar and then you might apply a machine learning model that does the top 100, the top 500, the top 1,000. You can kind of just continue on down from that. And reality is, it kind of depends on how much do you care about these things, right? As to how much you're gonna invest in that. Again, if you're making all of your money off of search, you probably should care about it. And you might want a number one versus number two, or at least a top 10 versus top 20 type models. The other things you can do here is, for instance, if you take your query intent, one of the things the query intent might do is say, this search belongs to this particular category. You might have a category per model. In fact, I was at an academic conference last year that Amazon presented at, and they have something like 130 or 140, I forget the exact number, different models depending on what category, you know, so jewelry might have its own model and, you know, snowblowers might have its own model, right? Kind of, again, depends on where you make your money as to how much time you would invest in there. You might also do things like put in bias corrections there. If you're not up on the latest in search, uh, all things equal, most people will pick the number one item regardless of what's there versus number two. So you might have some functionality in your system that allows you to perturb those results. Make number one, solar and all this stuff tells you it's number one. You might just make it number two and test to see how that works, right? Because it could just simply be that because of that first click or that first result bias, something that actually deserves to be higher up is not getting enough signals or click stream or any of those kinds of things in order to surface uh, uh, up to the top, so. And then of course, you can apply your results transformations, all of that kind of stuff. A little bit on the learning to rank side. Uh, there was a talk earlier by the Bloomberg folks. Go listen to that one if you want all the gory details. The cool thing is solar has got this built in these days. 
uh, and it's quite easy to use. And in fact, it also has some really nice tools around helping you with feature selection and those kinds of things. Um, the one caveat right now is you have to do your model training offline, uh, but you can use kind of standard training libraries like LibLinear, LibSVM, LambdaMart, all of these ones that if you read the academic literature are uh, commonly cited as the best performing system. So I'm not gonna go into too much details. I'll show you a little bit of this in action in the demo. Oops, I forgot my animations here. Sorry about that. If we look at the user side of all of this, we gotta capture what users are doing. Uh, yet again, this is if we go back to that, hey, this stuff is really expensive or it's really convoluted by the time it all fits. One of the things we just do at LucidWorks is put all that data right back in solar. It's very good at tracking events or signals as we call it. So I've kind of given away the punchline here, but these days what we do is we put it in solar, then we load it up via Spark, we build our clickstream models, we do things like our head tail analysis here, we build out recommenders and personalization and all that kind of stuff. And again, the documents just end up back in solar as models and then forwards back into that query edition that we talked about. That's all well and good. What does that query often look like? This is kind of pseudo Lucene solar syntax. Your mileage may vary. There's lots of other things you could do with it. I tend to think, this is kind of how I conceptually think about what all this stuff looks like as more or less a query to the engine. Right, It's not mathematically precise, but I kind of think about it as those first two, the exact original and the sloppy phrase. That's kind of like my really high precision content-based matches. That's what's gonna get me a highly accurate uh, set of results, right? And of course, all of those weights that I have on there, those can be learned or you can guess at them, try them out. And then I'll do things like ands and ors just to make sure that I'm getting everything. The or really becomes your recall query to make sure that you at least retrieve something that resembles what your user asked for. Many of you are probably already doing this with things like the eDismax or whatever other Lucene's disjunction, whatever it's named, uh, query underneath the hood. But probably these other things are new to you. So in fact, you can think about it. How do we bring in expansions, our click, our head tail relationships, all of those as queries. You can bring in your personalization biases. You can bring in learning to rank. All of these things start to seamlessly work together uh, and out comes your search results. Naturally, you can apply your filters, your hard filters across all of that as well with your filter queries. A um, couple of interesting things here, you know, like I said, one of it is you have a lot of knobs and dials. So if in your particular application, you don't have a lot of confidence in the quality of your click data, for instance, then maybe, you know, that YY there is lower than if you have a lot of confidence in that data. Um, depending on how you do your learning to rank, some of these things you maybe would push down into your learning to rank model if you wanted. There's some trade-offs there in terms of your essentially hard coding it into a model that you then have to reload anytime you want to change it. Whereas if you do it at query time, you have a little bit more flexibility in trying things out there. Um, and then, you know, things like your personalization biases, of course you need to be aware of what you're doing, what choices you're making when you personalize. You want to make sure that you're not uh, uh, doing bad or, or uh, encoding your own personal biases into those kinds of things. So this is just a quick solar syntax example. I'll leave it up there. You can look at it later, but essentially at the top, that's your main query. Things like filters are your query intent, like in this particular query, I'm classifying it as uh, computers and tablets. Uh, I've got a learning to rank model in there. I don't know why I have all this stuff uh, uh, URL encoded, but it is. And then things like my boosts and all of that stuff is at the bottom there. That's all great. Right, but at the end of the day, don't take my word for all this. One of the key things to modern relevance is you adopt an experimentation mindset, right? What you wanna do is within your company, drive down the cost of running an experiment. Most people don't know this, but most of the search engines, the big search engines, they run hundreds if not thousands of experiments a year, 
right? At any given time, it may be that only 10% of your users ever see what that engine considers to be the best version of the engine. Everything else is an experiment. Some experiments are going to be really good. Your marketing team will be really happy with you. Most experiments are going to be flat at best, and some of them are going to be really bad losers. So make sure you kill them when appropriate as fast as possible. If you want to learn more about that, uh, Ronnie Kohavni, I always butcher his name, has a really good talk on how Microsoft runs their experiment management framework. Uh, and then, you know, at the end of the day, we still have that 800-pound hammer, if you will, of rules of saying, I want Munich to be boosted this high up in the results. You can use things like the query elevation component or other uh, rule-based systems. I just try to encourage everyone when they're thinking about rules is to make sure they put the rules in the context of an experiment and they make sure that their rules have a lifespan. I can't tell you the number of places I've gone in where a customer will have 10,000 plus rules. And you say, oh, that rule right there, what's that do? And you'll get this blank stare back at you. Uh, Joe wrote that. Like, I've never met any Joe. I've been working with you for six months now. Where's Joe? Oh, Joe quit five years ago. I'm like, why is it still there? Well, Joe wrote it. He said it works. And on you go. And next thing you know, you've got 10,000 rules. You might as well not even have a search engine. Just have the rules return the documents, right? So just make sure you put rules in the context of the bigger picture that you're trying to do and think about how do, they, uh, how do you actually measure them for effectiveness and how do you make sure you continue to measure for effectiveness. All right. Cool. What does this stuff actually look like? I'll show you a demo of it. Uh, a couple of things. This is our architecture. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but Spark and Solar are the key pieces here, and then we've got some machine learning bits. Uh, we're going to focus in on, and in fact, the, the couple of key things going on here on the solar side, we've got all this extensive text ranking stuff. I don't want you to throw any of that out. That's still good stuff, and you've worked hard to learn that kind of stuff. Things like your different similarity models, BM25, cosine, whatever it is you want to uh, uh, use underneath the hood. Things like function queries, boost a block, the re-ranking capabilities, the learning to rank, all of that kind of stuff. On the Spark side, primarily there's a lot of uh, machine learning stuff. You could also use Mahout. You could use any engine out there you want. Um, but essentially, we need something that allows us to take all of these, this raw data, all of these signals, these clicks, et cetera, and churn that into uh, better search results. So what I'm going to do then is demo this. Uh, it's an e-commerce data set, uh, one 1.3 million items. Uh, the more interesting thing is out of this data set, you've got uh, one month of query logs. That's really the gold. That's stuff that you used to throw away. That's what you're keeping now. Uh, I've done the offline training of the models uh, offline. Uh, if you want to see how all of that gory details works, go watch the Bloomberg talk. Uh, et cetera, but I essentially just did, did, I took the signals, I rolled up on the user ID and the query, or not the user ID, on the query, and output the counts of the query document pairs, and I used that as a rough estimate of uh, relevance in terms of feeding that into the learning to rank module. And then I'm using Fusion, which like I said, the key parts here, Spark 2.1, and Solar 6, and then I built the UI out on top of it as well. So all things willing, live demo on my local laptop. Let me log in. A couple of different things I'll highlight here. Uh, first off, everything you see here is going to be done by searching against solar. I've calculated a bunch of stuff offline in Spark and installed that back into the, into the engine. First thing to note, we talked about A-B testing. You saw how that changed from tablets to TVs. One of the things that we just build in is the ability to do those experiments by essentially injecting parameters into the solar query to say, I want to search this way or I want to search that way. 
This particular one, I've set up a very simple experiment that's just gonna say TVs versus tablets, and as the user interacts with those, with that landing page, it will then auto-level. If TVs are performing better than tablets, those will be shown more. Shown more. If tablets are uh, getting more of the users, uh, then we'll move that up. And in fact, though, it has ways of, if TVs happen to be having a bad day one day, it will still show TVs enough such that over time, it figures out who's best. The other thing that's interesting here is just using all of that signal data in the product catalog, just doing a search against solar, getting back recommendations. I've done some more advanced things underneath the hood using some of the more modern uh, recommend recommender engine capabilities like alternating least squares and all of that kind of stuff. But essentially, I've got user-based recommendations. That's part of understanding that user. And now the moment of truth. If I come in here and I do a search for iPad, uh, what I've got here as a way of getting started is some very basic results. This is me doing a little bit of solar tuning. I think you would agree with me as search experts, they're all right. If you actually look at the data, you can see why those first ones match. They've got the word iPad in there. I'm essentially doing keyword matching here. Uh, the reality is, and I've also, I'm looking at uh, title description, and there's like this uh, sales rank data in there. Um, and in fact, those top three accessories for iPad are all highly uh, purchased items. So perhaps I'm boosting a little bit too much on that sales rank, and I could spend some time on it. But you know, the, la the fourth one there is the iPad. But the reality is, I think you would agree with me, these results are just okay. Uh, I'm going to show you Fusion just because it's mainly an easy way for me to edit all of this stuff. Let me make sure I'm logged in here. But essentially, what, and I'll show you the underpinnings, they just output parameters. I'm just outputting parameters of solar. I've got a particular pipeline set up here that's just doing solar queries. I'll show you that in a second. But let's get to the punchline first. I'm going to switch to one that uses signals. And then beyond that, I'll show you one with learning to rank. So now what I did is same query, doing the same search against solar, but now I've overlaid that signal information on there. I think you would agree with me, these results are a lot better. But you can still see that things like those accessories still show up here because people, in fact, when they search for iPad, are buying these accessories. If you look in the raw data, it's in there. But you know, your expectation here would be that we're finding the iPad. So that's all well and good. Uh, a couple of other things to note, built out. Uh, I've shown you one recommender, user for item recommenders. The query there is the user ID. The second one, this related searches, the query for that recommender is the query. So I'm doing query for query recommendations. If I click through on a particular item, I've got now item for item recommendations, yet another collection in solar, this time keyed by items and getting back results for those things. The cool thing, like I said here, is all that same data, that signal data, that clickstream data, can be used to measure or implement all of these things, and you have a much simpler deployment and all of that kind of stuff. Digging in a little deeper, let's actually look at what this stuff looks underneath the hood. Load up my query view here. I've got that default, maybe a little bit hard to read there in the back. Let me make that a little bit bigger. For those of you who are Solar or Lucene devs, this is just basically a little bit of an interface over the top of the EDIS Max query. You can see, like, this is where I spent some time early on. Like, oh, I think names are boosted by 10 and descriptions by 5 and all of that kind of stuff, right? And on down the chain, we could go and we get those results we saw first. If I load up that other pipeline, the one with the signal's on. A little bit different look to this one. The very first thing we do here is actually go query another collection called the signals aggregation collection. I've built that offline. It essentially has a time decayed based model off of what users are doing with this data, such that things that are popular today aren't necessarily popular tomorrow. Right? I do that query. Then I make decisions about how much do I care about how much do users care about the 
documents. That's what these roll-ups and boosts are, and then I'm applying rules. I'm not gonna show you the rules engine here today in the interest of time, but I hook in the rule stuff. So that's kind of that next level. First level was solar. Next level is I've, I'm using clickstream things. The last level here I can show you today is essentially one with the full shebang, if you will. The first stage I've got in my process of a request coming in is I'm actually, I've trained offline Infusion and Spark off of that same data. I've trained a classifier that tries to predict what category does this query belong to. And I'm just loading that up as a model. In fact, I'm loading it right out of solar as a model. Uh, and then the query comes in, it looks in the queue field, and then it's gonna output into the request pipeline a field called predicted query category, okay? The next thing I'm gonna do here then, and you could do a lot of things now, I've chosen to do one very simple thing, namely, I have a little bit of a condition that here that says basically, if this query category is anything other than other, then apply a filter to this content, okay? You could do boosts off of that, you could, change your learning to rank model, you could do lots of different things here. Um, and then, you know, I've done things like I turn on learning to rank and then all the rest of this is the same. Let me come back here and I'll just show you uh, what this looks like right here instead of going back to the main UI. You can see, so for instance, let me turn off the filter query. You can see there's Zag, Apple iPad, yada, yada. Those are promoted up. If I, and there's 1,800, it's a little hard to read back there. There was 1,800 results returned there. If I turn on that filter, it now filters down. It is essentially categorizing iPad as a computer or tablet. I'm applying that as a filter query against the category name. And now I've only got 896 results. Uh, you can see also I have some interesting results here at the top. Those are in fact uh, built off the learning to rank model. If I turn those off, I can get those results. The learning to rank model, I just did a very simple uh, set of features there, things like the price and a few other pieces off of there. I didn't spend a lot of time on making sure the learning to rank model this is the absolute best learning to rank model. I just spent time on making sure all the plumbing works. Uh, if you want to, you have to spend a lot more time on the features and all of that kind of stuff. So that's the demo. If you want, uh, there's some resources. I think we've got a couple of minutes left for questions. Thank you. Are there questions in the audience? There's one in the middle. Give me a second. Hi there. So on your perfect query slide, you mentioned all the different boosts, the X, the Y, the Z, and so on, and said, hey, all of them can be learned. And now I was wondering what's coming up to learn the very first, the X, that you give basically to the BM25 model, to these cores. Can we learn them already as well in the context of LTR? Yeah, exactly. That's kind of what the LTR stuff does. You know, you could essentially, if you look at the LTR stuff, that's a great question. You could factor in a lot more of these things as part of the LTR model, right? So, so my question is, are there any of the Yeah, so in fact, the question was, are they available to the offline learning? If you look at the... Uh, uh, the example that Solar ships with, there's this little Python program in there, and it, it basically, as it's training, it's taking in the set of relevance results that you gave it, and then it's hitting the features and getting the content back from Solar to get that offline, to get the information for training. So it's essentially saying, oh, I've got this relevance information, match it up with the documents that are in Solar already, and then learn a model off of those features. So yeah, you definitely could represent some of those things as part of, uh, as part of the offline learning to rank stuff, right? The, Caveat with, you know, we use learning to rank for a lot of these things. There's also these other places where you want machine learning, like your query intent and all of that kind of stuff that maybe or maybe not belong in the inner loop or the near inner loop 
of a learning to rank model. So depending on what kind of flexibility you want, you may decide to do some of this classification stuff up front or some of it in the learning to rank area. Yeah. Uh-oh, Doug's going to ask me a tough question. I was curious in your experience uh, if you've used learning to rank directly as a recommendation solution and how it compares versus like ALS or other traditional offline methods. That's a great question. I actually haven't compared those two. Um, you certainly could. I mean, essentially a search engine, the math is roughly maybe not the same as like an ALS or some of these latent models that are doing like latent factorization, that kind of stuff. But you probably could get reasonably close uh, in terms of performance and you don't have this offline step if you don't want to, which you know may or may not. Kind of again, there's always this threshold in my mind of like how much time do I want to invest in it? And that threshold is almost always based off of how much money do you make off of your search engine and how many people do you have on your team, right? So just doing a pure solar or pure whatever Lucene, you can certainly get a good model. Taking it to that next level, I didn't really show it here, but uh, you know, for instance, all of those models, like right here, this is your output from my learning, my offline ALS model. It's just item ID and other item ID, right? The related searches is, I don't know why I'm looking up there when I can look here. The related searches, same kind of thing here. You know, people who search for Bauer and Wilkins also search for workaholics, those kinds of things. The cool thing here, right, is all your data is just right back in solar, right? And so you can take and you don't have to have this big long trip, you know, between Omniture and all those other pieces. All right. Oh, let's think around again. Thank you.